Any of you that were here last week, we began a message. This will be a second part. It'll be a final part two. It's a message that I titled The Greatest Fear of Satan. And as you'll notice up on the screen, the sentence is finished for us. And it says that the greatest fear of Satan is that you would believe what God says about you. The more I go on and am given days, the more important it becomes to me to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Many will preach a message on identity, and you'll hear every version, you'll hear every kind and everything, but I, I tell you that there's something about understanding what God gave to us through the death, the resurrection, the power of Jesus Christ. There's something that we need to continue to get a hold of. So today, we're going to continue this, this message. We're going to address the power and authority to a very small degree of what God's Word says about it. And if you were here last week, when we began this message, we learned of some of the reasons why Satan, also known as Lucifer, the serpent, son of the morning, the great dragon, the adversary, the enemy, the devil, the thief, the father of lies, on and on. We, we learned why Satan was judged by God Almighty and cast out from heaven. We read in Isaiah 14 about the five times that it's written where Satan lifted himself up in pride and declared, I will ascend into heaven and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God and I will sit upon the mount of the congregation and I will be like the Most High. And we learned of His judgment as recorded in Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 where it says, and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And because of this we see the conflict between good and evil still raging today as Satan attacks believers, as recorded even in 1 Peter 5 and 8, where Peter admonished everyone to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as, my emphasis, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Again, the emphasis is it didn't call him a lion. It's the appearance as a lion, which means that the power of a lion, the strength of a lion, is going to be diminished if we are in that place to receive what God says again about you and I. Amen? So today, in this second, in this final part of the series, 
we will see what God says about you. And if you recall last week, we touched on a powerful life verse that I love so well. It's found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 that reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Do you know what the real value that is found here? It's actually revealed in the second chapter of Genesis, verse 7, where it says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's the real value of what we have been given. Somebody, somewhere, at some time, made a determination that the value of all of the chemicals and compounds that are found within this human body We're talking about things like the oxygen, the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the calcium, the phosphorus, okay, is worth less than $600. (laughs) That's a somewhat worthless point, okay? But I use it to exaggerate that the real value is the breath of God that was breathed into every one of us. Am I right? And we, you and I, became a living soul. You see, God took pleasure in the beginning. Let us, the Trinity, God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they said, let's Do something special here. It was the sixth day. It was the time when everything else had been created, had been identified as, wow, this is good. But when he made man, he took pleasure in creating us to look and to be like his character, to be like him. And that is why at the end of that sixth day, he looked again at what he had created, and he said, this is very, very good. Something absolutely touched the heart of our Father to be able to say, now we're going somewhere. Now watch what happens. And that is exactly why we must wage a good spiritual warfare because the enemy will try to create as much adversity as possible with the creation that God made. That's just the only thing he's got left. Okay? But thank God. But God. But thank God we can read the back of the book. Revelation chapter 20, and God wins. We win. Amen? Even as it says in Revelation 12 and verse 11, it says, and they, you and I, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's for you and I. That's how we can overcome. By the blood of the Lamb. By the word of 
our very own testimony. So the takeaway that I want to leave this morning with all of us is to ponder the thought, what does it look like to honestly reign in life? To have this dominion and the power that was given to us at the very beginning, to have that in, in our life here that was decreed over mankind, that was declared and given to everyone at the beginning. What does it look like to honestly reign, have dominion in life, and to not be controlled by the circumstances of life. To not be affected that when something happens, we just fall apart. Now I know, there's, there's stuff. I get it. Life happens. We do it. But how, what does it look like to be able to have dominion over every circumstance so that that verse in Romans 8.28 can come to life where it says that we know that all things work together for good. We say, well, how can it be good if something happened to me? If something hard happened to me? How can I even find good in that? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what does it look like to be able to take God's Word and look at the dominion that we were given in the beginning and to reign in life through Jesus Christ and be able to come to the end of every day and say, thank God, once again, you helped me. We made it through. Amen? Come on, let me hear somebody here. I honestly think that the initial answer to that thought is to understand that the power and the ability given to us through Jesus Christ is not there because we're so brilliant or because we've got it all figured out with such a great strategy for our transformation of being able to succeed and make it in life. It's not because of anything within us. No. The power and the ability is there because you said yes in that secret place. Come on. That's where the power continues if we're going to make it in any part, if we're going to succeed according to what God's Word says. In order for us to reign in life and not be tossed and to and fro with every challenge or circumstance that comes our way, we must know what he says about us and what he, our loving Father, provided for and bestowed upon every born-again, Bible-believing, overcoming son or daughter of God. Can I get an amen? So, let's talk some facts, okay? Let's talk the Word. When you, if you, have been born again, when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, Colossians 1 and 13 says, you were delivered from the power of darkness. It says, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now the word power that is used here is the Greek word exousia. 
In the Strong's Concordance, it's number 1849, okay? And it's literally translated authority. Exousia power is defined as a privileged or delegated influence or a right to have control. You have been delivered from the power. You have been delivered from the authority of darkness and placed into God's kingdom. And in many instances, the King James translators use the word power instead of authority, even though, as in this verse, the Greek word was exousia. Okay? Authority. What's the difference? Not, not too much. Um, as far as I, uh, I see. Not too much of a concern in most contexts, but in order to not confuse authority with power, here's an easy example to help us understand the difference. If I walked into a room where my children were having a rout or they were misbehaving, that wouldn't happen to mine, but you know, somebody else might. If I did, the power of my choice to spank someone could be exercised. But my authority as the dad should carry or prevent the use of that power to spank. Hear me out now. I should be able to walk into that room and without even having to say a word with my eyes, whatever I do or did, okay, they would, okay, and it would, without even having to say a word, the misbehavior would stop. My authority is recognized. Am I making sense? Are you following me here? Okay. If it wasn't, and the kids weren't being too uh, smart that day or being very keen, okay, then my power to correct the situation would be I'd get the maxi stick out, okay, or you know what I'm saying, okay. There's a difference there. And Jesus said in Matthew 28 and verse 18, he said, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The word power here is number 1849. It's exousia. It's authority. Okay? It was the authority given to us as part of our inheritance as a son, as a daughter, of God. You have entered into this position of authority because you are in Him. In July of 1973, I used my authority as a human being and made a choice. I made the decision to receive Jesus as Lord of my life my Savior. I repented of my sins and asked Him to forgive me and fill me with the baptism of fire. At that moment, the fulfillment of 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 came inside me. I was made the righteousness of God in Christ. It says, He has made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Another good example of authority is found in Matthew 8, verse 5. It says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, or Capernaum, however you want to say it, there came unto Him a centurion beseeching Him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Can I stop there a minute? Do you realize how 
odd that was that a Jew, Jesus, would even have conversation with a Roman soldier, a centurion, even at that. You see how, again, God looks at what? The heart. And this man was loved by God. Regardless of his stature, regardless of his, his citizenship, God loved him. And he had a need. So he came to Jesus. The centurion answered after Jesus said, not a problem. I'll come and I'll heal him. The centurion answered him. Verse 8. said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. You see, there is confidence in authority. What did the centurion say? I'm a man under authority. I know that when I speak, it'll happen. There's confidence in that, am I right? And there is identity that is found in authority. There is, again, when we exercise our authority, that's when we know all you have to do, just speak the word, because I know that your word is true, and it'll take place. Let's go to that next screen here for me, please. So fact number one as we see up on the screen here. Jesus secured our power and authority, and we, you and I, have the authority to preach this gospel. We know that Jesus succeeded in securing all power. How? By going to the cross, dying a horrible death, suffering the penalty for sin and defeating Satan in the pit of hell. He came to earth as a man for one reason, to reconcile man back to God, to take back what the enemy had deceived man, causing him to fall, to save us. But it is not enough for us to simply accept Jesus' work at Calvary. You and I, we are held responsible for much more. Jesus' words in the 16th chapter of Mark delegated the authority for you and I to carry out that work And he said unto them, red letter words of Jesus, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow. Boy, I want to say that again. These signs might follow if you're having a good day. No, that's not how it went. These signs, if you're really praying hard, might follow. These signs shall 
follow them that believe. What's the requirement on us? Believe. Just believe. Believe God's word. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. God's word. Drop the mic. It's there. Done. The believer is the one with the power and authority to do these things. Verse 20, same chapter, Mark 16, says this, They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with what? Signs following. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I believe God's word. I believe God's word. I believe God's word. God will confirm his word, but first it has to be put forth. That's where you and I come in. He has given us the authority to speak his word. He will use our hands and that believers, we must lay hands on the sick by faith, believing that God, God will perform His Word. Amen. Let's go to that next screen. Fact number two. We have authority to stand against Satan, and we are seated with him in high authority. Okay, again, keep focused here. What we're talking about is understanding what God says about you. So in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, it says, again, red letter, words of Jesus, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, serpents and, scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and hopefully nothing will hurt you oh that's not what it said did is it nothing shall by any means hurt you I believe God's word I believe God's word and if we look two times power is used in this verse the Greek words of power are not the same. The first power to tread on serpents, serpents and scorpions is number 1849, authority. It's exousia. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. The second power is number 1411 in the Strong's Concordance, and it's dunamis. The same word that we get, dynamite. So, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all of the dunamis power and of the enemy. That's explosive. That's stopping right there, devil. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's the reality that we want to always strive for. Amen? In Revelation 9, we see even that the ones who had authority over the locusts, who had power as scorpions that were released from the bottomless pit, uh, read it, I'm not going to take time to go through the whole thing there, but... As the fifth angel came and the bottomless pit was open, locusts came out, and they had as power of scorpions to hurt who? It says, read it for yourself, those who did not 
have the seal of God in their forehead. So who would they not have been able to hurt? Those who had authority that had the seal, that had God present in their life. I believe God's Word. I believe God's Word. And even if I don't quite get how is that going to happen, I still believe God's Word. Amen. Amen. One of the most vital areas of the believer's authority is in his power to successfully stand against Satan. Ephesians 4 and 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. And in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul describes the armor that we as believers are to wear in combat against Satan. He explains each piece of that armor. You're familiar with it. It's the armor of God. But not once does he say that God will put the armor on you or that God will fight the devil for you. Huh? You is the understood subject of these verses. Come on, now listen. You be strong in the Lord. You put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, you stand. I believe God's Word. God has given you the power and the authority to stand against Satan and his destructive works. He has provided the armor, but it is your responsibility as a believer to put on that armor and to stand. (sighs) James 4 and 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. Are you following me? The armor and the weapons are at our disposal. It's what God has given to each of us. We have the power and the authority to take the Word of God, the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit and run Satan out of our affairs. I remember a vision that Dr. Stephen Francis had, and I don't have all of the details, but the gist of it was that he saw a pile of weapons, guns and arsenal, piled on the front of a a stage area like this. And they were rusty. They hadn't been used. But when the people came up and took that rusty gun or whatever off of that pile, it became oiled, it became loaded, it was ready for action. And the whole thing, and again, I don't have all of the details on it, I have to go back and and listen to it again, but it was being mindful of not leaving your weapons unused. Because if you do, you will not be able to engage them. But when you do, when you pick up what God has given to each and every one of us, it is lock, stock, barrel, ready, oiled, it's game on. And we have that power and authority. Amen? Now listen to how plainly the Word speaks to us in Ephesians 1 and verse 17. We quoted this last week. It's powerful. It does not hurt us to hear it again. Ephesians 1 and 17 says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the Spirit of wisdom 
and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the, state, in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and over every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Are we the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all? But if we keep reading into chapter 2 and verse 1 of Ephesians, it says, and you has he quickened. He's brought alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. And in verses 5 and 6, chapter 2 even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where do you live? I brought a message on that. Where are you seated? Where do you consider your house? Where are you living? We are seated together with him. Where? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And as a believer, we have accepted the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. Therefore, as believers, we are part of his body And we are seated with him in that highly exalted place of authority. Amen? Go to the next screen, please. We must believe what he says about us. Fact number three. We have authority to act as new creatures as new creations. Let me chapter and verse for you. Second Corinthians 5 and 17 says who we are. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We have got to know that that verse is real for us. Old things are passed away. We are not living in the past. We are not seen by God in any other way, through any other lens, other than in our destiny. Amen? He sees us as a new creature if we have repented, we have asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Lord, Savior, Deliverer, Healer. Holy Ghost baptizer. Hallelujah. Hebrews 2 and 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So who's got power? Jesus Christ said that he destroyed the enemy that had the power of death. And for us to take and partake of that spirit and life, we've got to take the responsibility of standing in the place of authority as the new creation in Christ Jesus that he calls us to be. 1 Peter 1 and 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible 
by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It was the word of Almighty God that was injected into your spirit man. Your DNA carries what God has put inside of us to bring about this new birth in your life. And Ephesians 4 and 21 says, If so be that you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You are the one in authority. It is your responsibility, my responsibility, to put off the old man. We, you and I, must use the Word of God to renew our mind. You, you and I, we need to put on the new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Let's go to that last screen here. Fact number four. We can minister and walk from a point of authority. From a point of exousia. From that point that God gave to each and every one of us in his earthly ministry we know that Jesus very simply many times very short to the point said things like be thou made whole said take up your bed and walk said Lazarus come forth it wasn't some long, drawn-out prayer of, Oh, God, we beseech Thee, Almighty God. Alone. It was, Now, come forth. Now, be whole. Now, go. Then to a lame man, Peter even said in Acts chapter 3, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. Such as I have, I give to you. What I have, here it is. Peter spoke from a point of authority. A Christian's power is not his own. And after God used Peter to heal a lame beggar, the apostle explained to the astonished onlookers, to everyone that was gathered in that temple area, that the man was healed not by Peter or John's own power, but through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. It says, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Acts chapter 3, verse 12. 16. For such a time as this, it's time for us as believers to walk in our authority. We have obtained an inheritance. Legally, it is ours. And in that inheritance, we've been given all authority. 
He lives. He walks in you. He wouldn't have said in his own words, Revelation 3 and 20, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear. Hear what? Hear that knock. Hear that call of God, that Spirit of God tugging at your heart. If any man will hear that knock and open the door, I'm knocking. And when you open the door, he says, I'll come in. I'm there. I'm ready for you to cross that threshold for you to come into my house to be a part of me and it says and I'll sup with him that means a lot to me communion with a father that loves us communion fellowship when we sit down and have supper with someone, we don't just sit with our heads over our plates, shoveling food into our mouth and not say a word to anybody around you. You are, we'll pray for you, okay? But when you have supper, when you go out and you say, hey, let's go out and have some lunch. We fellowship. We talk. And say, what, what's, what's God been showing you? What's, what's new? What's happening in your life? Let me share how good our God is. Jesus said, I'll sup with you. He's given us keys. My prayer today is that each one of us, I'm preaching to myself. My prayer is that each one of us would stop ringing the doorbell. and start using the keys. How silly is it if we've been given a million dollars in our bank account and we declare ourselves to be a millionaire but we never go to the bank and draw it out. How silly would it be to have a mansion to have a nice home but every time I come up to enter the house I ring the doorbell and knock on the door saying let me in and I'm sitting here holding the keys it doesn't make sense does it Jesus said I've given you the keys of the kingdom I know that we can all do so much more together as family, praying for one another, helping one another. But ultimately, it's up to each and every one of us to dig into God's Word and see what He says about you. You've got the keys. No one can take them from you. 
No one can rip them. No one can foreclose on your house. Because you own it. Use your understanding in knowing that God truly loves you. And when He says, I'll never forsake you, He really, really means it. Because He was forsaken. At the cross, He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did that. God did forsake his own son. So that, I believe God's word, so that we would never, ever have to be forsaken. I'm talking to somebody in here. You feel alone sometimes. You feel like you're just having to make your own way and try to figure stuff out and you're going through a funk that you don't even know why. God, take the keys that we've been given and unlock what He says about you and what treasure you have in Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord God Almighty, for the, for the power of the blood applied. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for the power of the blood applied. It means something. It really, really happened. It really, really took place. There really, really is power in that name. There really, really is power and authority that He gave to each and every one of us because the blood of Jesus Christ covers me. He covers you. That's who you are. That's who He says you are. So kick the enemy out. Stand up and say, I receive God's holy word Amen. Amen. Repeat it with me. I believe God's Word. I believe God's Word. And no matter what it is, health, financial, thoughts, aloneness, doesn't matter. He has it covered because the blood is applied in our lives. And I thank God for that. So may the peace of God and the richness of His Word be with each and every one of you this day.